Welcome to Open Accents, and welcome to LCDQ, the yearly tradition where the design elite descend upon Los Angeles for three days to day drink and ignore their clients. <laughs> I think this is the first event that I've been to where there hasn't been an open bar. There's a bar at every single event, and there are events all day long. <laughs> But seriously, thank you for coming out today um, and ignoring your responsibilities to celebrate the industry. I'm um, very excited to present a panel with a bunch of very special lady bosses who I have recently had the pleasure of working on a very special project uh, that involved uh, environmentally responsible design. Um, and today we're going to talk about upcycling, uh, vintage, which is one of my favorite subjects, and um, also this idea of sustainability. And, WTF is that nowadays. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we have uh, Jenna Christensen. Um, please welcome her. So Jenna started her career in the fashion industry and entered the rug business in 2005. She was forging deals with companies like Pottery Barn, Williams Sonoma Home. Um, she's known in the design industry for her creative collaborations and established emerging artists. She's worked in tandem with organizations like LA Arts Association, PS Arts, the Art of uh, Elysium, Elysium uh, to ensure that we keep investing in the artists of the future. And then in, in 2013, she joined the team here at Woven Accents, launching a line of limited edition rugs inspired by art in the streets. In addition to Growing Woven's innovative artist collaborations, Jinna is helping shape the brand by managing special projects creating special partnerships, and spearheading growth into new markets. How awkward was that, just hearing you say that all about your in front of you? Give another round of applause for Jenna. Okay, and next, she's the former VP of Worldwide Marketing at Levi Strauss & Company, a seasoned advertising account exec, and sometime a Today Show guest. With a discerning eye and a lively joie de vivre, this Columbia University art history major did some serious time in the fashion and advertising and publicity trenches before getting hitched, having three kids, and learning the cost, style, and green advantages to buying vintage. Today, she's the brains and beauty behind everyone's favorite source for online vintage, Cherish. Please welcome Anna Brockway. I saved you the embarrassment of talking about you in front of you. I know how uncomfortable it is. <laughs> and next, she is the founder and chief creative officer of The Honest Company, which she launched in 2012 with a mission to inspire and empower people to live a healthy life. She is also an actress, an activist, uh, and a New York Times bestselling author. Um, she was among the top 20 of Fast Company's 100 most creative people in business, one of CNBC's next list of rebels, leaders and innovators, and one of Fortune's 10 most powerful women entrepreneurs. Please give a big welcome to Jessica Alba. talk about a project that we did together, Jess. Actually, all four of us have done together, along with some other very special brands. Um, it was the remodeling and decoration of your second home in Los Angeles. Well, it was technically my first home. Oh, tell us about that. Well, um, I started to get jobs, and um, I made money, and I needed to put it somewhere, so I bought a house, but I couldn't afford to furnish it, so I slept on an air mattress for like two years. <laughs> and that's that house. Um, and then I just, every job that I got, I would like buy furniture and put that into the house. So I got eventually bed, and then another bed, and then a couch, so that was cool. Um, and, then, and then I grew out of it because I had a baby and it was really scary to be pregnant and have like a spiral staircase. So then we had to get a family home, but I still kept this house because I don't know, it's like a piece of my, my soul. Sentimental value. Yeah. Um, so I always, I always held on to it, and uh, I wanted to breathe new life into it and, and hang on to it and let other people share um, in that experience of living in this really great place. 
So Jess and I have worked together through um, Domain, which is now my domain, um, shooting a few of her spaces and helping her with some decor. So um, she approached uh, me and my partner Brandon, we have a design firm called Consort, and she had this really great idea to uh, give new life into this house, but she wanted all of the remodeling and decoration to be done as uh, environmentally responsible as possible. So um, on day one, I was you know, talking a lot with Brandon about like, well, we gotta do this sustainably, we gotta do this sustainably. And then kind of preparing for this panel again today, I found myself doing the same thing, which is asking, you know, Google, what, what is sustainable design? <laughs> and the answers that you get are far and varied, and everyone has a different answer, and it just basically means something different to every company or uh, you know, every person in terms of how they want to live responsibly. I think if you look at the ASID, they're going to have a very strict list of rules and requirements uh, that would make you a sustainable designer. But um, I think nowadays, everyone's just trying to be as responsible as possible. So I wanted to talk to you guys today about how you do that in your businesses and how you continue to innovate in the sustainable arena. Um, so let's start actually with Jinnah. Um, I thought it was appropriate to have the panel here because rugs, in fact, are one of the oldest upcycled product in the history of interior design. I mean, what are some of the oldest rugs that you guys sell here? I mean, we have rugs that, can everyone hear me? Uh, we have rugs that date back to, you know, the 1860s, 1870s. So, I mean, it's really sort of extraordinary. What can, what can be more upcycled than a 300-year-old rug? <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about the origins of Woven Accents. So, we started as an antique and vintage uh, rug dealer, selling to other rug dealers. Um, and our founder, Abraham Morazadeh, who I know is, oh, he is here. Um, he just got back from a buying trip. He's still our buyer today. And he really started this business from a place and a desire to be different and with a love of the uniquely beautiful. And we referred to him as the Indiana Jones of the rug business because he loves the hunt. And he has traveled from the beginning all over the world to small towns. Now it's mostly in Europe, but it used to be, you know, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, you know, West Virginia to find these pieces where people didn't really know what they had. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about what uh, makes a vintage item more valuable, and it's kind of the history behind the product. So, uh, you know, Sam and his family sources these from all over the world, but they remember every story from everyone that they bought these things from, right? Oh yes, Abraham has a story for every rug. In fact, I remember him telling me a story once, I think he was in Alabama, and he went to a home and was having tea with a woman who was showing him the rug that she had, you know, from a, a grandparent that had inherited. And they're sitting there drinking tea outside and there's a little goat, you know, the woman has a goat, pet goat, and he's sitting there petting the goat. And it's like all these little details that he remembers from every purchase, so it's... Well, it's great. Well, one thing that sets you apart from other traditional rug companies is that you're always pushing the envelope and you're always taking a very fashion forward approach to everything that you do, um, including some really cool upcycled efforts that we'll get to later. Um, but we're very excited to be here. And now, so The Honest Company sells products that are effective, safe, beautiful, and accessible, and also responsible. And it's become a trusted resource committed to providing education and support across its community of members. Um, its growing portfolio of more than 100 products addresses an ever-growing category needs of baby, personal care, home care, vitamins and supplements, and gear, and more. The Honest Company now has a presence across the US and Canada at Honest.com and in over 3,500 leading retail locations. Whoa. <laughs> so how did that come to be? Oh, Lord. Um, well, it came out of a real, um, a real need and desire that I had in wanting to create a safe and healthy environment for my family. And I found that it was very challenging to try and shop around the issue of the use of toxic chemicals in um, everyday products that lead to and that are linked to chronic illnesses, everything from allergies, asthma, to autism, obesity, and all sorts of cancers. Um, I was very sick when I was a kid. I had chronic asthma and allergies, and I had several different surgeries. My mother had cancer. My grandmother died of cancer. 
um, and we've had just a lot of, we felt the uh, impact of uh, how the environment can affect your health and my family. And when I was bringing a new little person into the world, I wanted to safeguard her and I wanted to make sure that she had the best chance at life. And uh, when I looked around and um, read labels and I would buy even eco-friendly and things that cost four or five times more than your average conventional product with pictures of nature on it. It was beige and brown. It wasn't exactly my aesthetic, but I was like, what the heck? I'm sure it's better. And I found out that the juice inside was just as toxic as any other conventional brand, but their packaging was more responsible. And I was like, that's not good enough. I want something that's gonna be safe and healthy on the inside, the actual solution, the actual product, the ingredients. Um, along with the packaging being responsible. And why does responsible packaging have to be beige? <laughs> what is up with that? So I put an emphasis on it has to be effective, it has to be safe and non toxic, it has to be beautifully designed and affordable. Because if you're only affecting the 0.1%, you're not really doing anything but giving rich people a better life. They don't need a better life. Everybody needs a better life. So, um, so that was the mission, and I really just found a need in the marketplace, and it took me three years to figure out how to go about it, and um, that's The Honest Company. <laughs> and uh, you've expanded, you have beauty, you have- Well, not yet. Um, it's coming. Uh, we're launching uh, Feminine Care next, and then and then Beauty. That's right. When I was in your office, you had all of the kind of like selects for the design of these new feminine products on yeah. the wall. And you were like, which one do you like? And they were all super cool. Yeah, they're cute, right? So if nothing else, <laughs> if nothing else, your legacy could be Jessica Alba making tampons cool. I mean, <laughs> if I can be remembered for something. <laughs> Um, so what was the eco space like when you first set out to start this company? Beige, brown, boring, and ineffective. Um, I think that there are a lot of people that had a lot of great intentions, um, but I don't know if they exactly knew how to execute on it um, for the millennial. I, it was also such a, a bizarre idea to want things that are vintage. I mean, that is the most sustainable and most eco-friendly way to put together a home. So when I was putting together my home, uh, my family home, I was scouring Craigslist and eBay, and that's how I shopped. I used non-toxic paint. Um, I had to actually make a lot of furniture um, using non-toxic filler. Um, for the cushions because a lot of it's just made out of solidified petroleum and, um, and then fine fabrics that aren't sprayed with formaldehyde because I wanted, again, that environment inside my home to be as safe and healthy as possible. But um, buying vintage is, so, is, is like one of the best ways to be sustainable and it's something that I did. So my dad would go and pick up furniture for me from Tarzana to or like Orange County. He would all these random places, and he'd be like, are you sure about this? And he would like send me pics of the pieces of furniture that I would, that I would uh, buy online, because you know, obviously I couldn't go and pick it up, plus there's some like creep status. And so I'm so happy now that we have Cherish, so we don't have to deal with random creepers who are like, waiting for you to come to their house and do something weird. Yeah, there, was definitely a, there was definitely a thrill back in the day of searching for vintage online and you really had to dig and you really had to dig yeah. hard. And it was you had to it dig hard. before Craigslist even had gallery thumbnails, it was yeah. it was just like clicking through all of the images and making phone calls and trying to I coordinate. I mean it was hours and hours of digging. And you know, you have to be scared of Craigslist rapists and killers. No, it's true. <laughs> That's why my dad went on my <laughs> We should not say that. <laughs> but luckily, We're kidding. That's a joke. I love Craigslist. Um, but luckily, along the way, we have a new solution where we can shop vintage online in a more streamlined way. Yeah. Enter Cherish. Um, so, Anna, how did Cherish begin? I mean, it's a similar. Is this it's thing a, on? It's a similar story to what. It's a similar story to what Jess was describing. I was looking to furnish my house. We had a lot of kids really fast and moved a lot. And um, I was looking for a dining room table. 
And I went through this process of scouring through pages and pages on eBay, looking for the perfect thing. I finally found it. It was like an, um, a lady who was moving to an old folks home in North Carolina. Um, so I had to figure out, you know, first off, how to negotiate with her when she was deaf over the phone and get the price right and then, you know, figure out how to get it picked up and move it here. I mean, it was just so hard. Um, and at the same time, I got a really beautiful dining room table for $1,200 and it cost me $450 to ship it. And when I went down to the design center and looked at them, they were like $35,000. So it was like, what a great deal if I could take the friction out of this in terms of the finding and the transportation and the negotiation and bring it all together in one place online, make it easy to search um, and have it be edited so you only get the good stuff. Wouldn't that be awesome? And so that's when my husband and I decided to start the business. Now, I've been listening. Does anyone listen to this uh, podcast, Startup? It's incredible, right? It, it follows a guy who was, it's a startup about creating a network of podcasts. So it, it's very like self-reflective the entire way he goes along because he documents the process of um, starting his own business. But it's very evergreen for anyone who's ever tried to start anything on their own. Um, but what I find really interesting, and he's, he talks a lot about how, uh, you know, finding his unfair advantage in the industry. Um, Anna, what do you think was your unfair advantage when you set out to start Char Cherish? Um. I hate calling it unfair because I feel like we fight so hard for it. But um, putting together a great team, you know, I think um, there's five of us as the core executive team, and four of them um, have created over a billion dollar value in marketplaces, um, primarily in the travel business. I come from fashion, so I have that perspective. It's a really amazing technology team. So I think that together, that was a really powerful thing that got us started. And I think also being first, being first to market counts a lot, um, and so getting ahead of it was really important. Jess, what about you? I, I would say the team, um, you know, I, I knew I wanted to launch the company with a subscription model, I don't know if you guys are aware, but we're on honest.com, and two, three of the services, we have three subscriptions, one is a diapers and wipes subscription, another one is an essential, so you choose five items out of 70 and you get them delivered whenever you want on a, you know, every two weeks, every four weeks, every six weeks, eight weeks, depending on what your needs are, um, or you can do a health and wellness bundle, which is vitamins. Um, now, my business partner um, created the subscription e-commerce business model, and so um, when we were walking into rooms, and on the honest company was his third startup so he launched uh, legalzoom.com the, the next one was shoedazzle.com and my was the third so i really believe the unfair advantage was him because he had been through it he had made mistakes uh in business he learned from them and applied his findings with the company he also every venture capital wanted to invest uh, every venture capital firm wanted to invest in him any business that Brian wanted to start. And so I was just lucky that I was with, you know, the girl that everybody wanted to date. <laughs> and then being able to leverage my authentic relationship with the media. So our marketing spend is, is significantly lower because of that uh, for lunch. So having a good team um, is definitely important in any beginning stages of starting a business. That's not fair. It's unfair. Uh, so let's move on to talk about the house. There she is, that dress. How perfect was that dress for that picture? Come on. The room only came to life when you sat on that sofa. <laughs> so the house is in Beverly Hills. It's around 4,000 square feet, um, three stories with a really cool spiral staircase that goes from top to bottom. Um, you, previous to this, decorated your own house. Basically, you did it all yourself right? Your, your house that you actually live in. Well, I, I, I worked with someone to execute on all of the design that I, yeah. And I remember when I... It was a lot of work. I, because you sourced everything... It was really stressful. Second hand, everything was yeah, upcycled. it was just a lot of work. So what were the sites at the times that you were using for that? Craigslist? A lot of it was Craigslist and eBay. Um, I mean, I did work with a designer, but, you know, we didn't always see eye to eye, mm -hmm. so... I feel like I'm not in the, the right room to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you guys are going to mock me. <laughs> but you know, you don't always see eye to eye. Um, I was just really adamant about the sustainability. I was really adamant about wanting to use vintage. And you know, at the time, it was just 
it just wasn't done. And so when someone's trying to leverage their relationships with people that do make new stuff, and she couldn't do that necessarily, it, so. So yeah, it was stressful. So then we shot that house, and then you came to me and you were but like, then, but then you were really great. I know. We actually, <laughs> this is a very smooth process. Yeah, it was really, really, really smooth. But I think we got a soft start because we did your bedroom yeah. first in your house that you actually live in, which that you can is. also see on domain. Yeah, it's um, really great. And that was the first time I had ever taken on a project where someone had enlisted me to make sure that everything was, you know, very responsible and very thoughtfully done in terms of being eco-friendly, uh, you know, low VOC paints. Um, I, I will never forget when you came in and you saw the finished product for the first time, you were like, kind of walking around, you were like, I think there's some off-gassing going on here. And I was like, oh my god, she's the president of the Honest Company, she can smell off-gassing. <laughs> Super no, human, honest powers. It was just something that was oiled. There was something oiled, and I have a sensitive nose. <laughs> so you're always pushing me to up the game in a responsible way. Um, so with your first house, no one had really, it hadn't been inhabited in a couple of years, right? It was just kind of sitting there. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I was sitting there for like a year and a half. Yeah, because we moved back in there while we were redoing the, our other house for the new baby. So why did you decide, because I know a lot of your family was like, let's just sell that thing, and you had a different vision for it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, if you can keep something, and you can breathe new life into it instead of it tearing it down or selling it to someone who would eventually just tear it down. I don't know, there's something about the history of it. There's something about the stories that were told in the space. I mean, that's why I like vintage. There's something kind of sentimental about something that's had a life and gets passed on. It's, it's I don't know, just maybe a more romantic way to look at it. So and you can just tear it down and start all over from scratch. Right. So in a way, you were like upcycling the house. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> um, and then ways that we talked about, um, you know, keeping the renovation and the decor process in line with your own responsible living practices. Um, you know, you, we we really kind of came from this place of integrated design, where you were very involved from the beginning and at every point of every choice that was made with all team members from contractor to designer to you know our assistants to make sure that everything was being done as responsibly as possible um, so I think that's kind of a good takeaway for any design team who isn't green certified or meeting all of these requirements of the ASCI ID you know one thing that you can do is to just make sure to have this very clear line of communication to make sure that you're executing your clients vision and trying to be responsible yeah, I mean, I think that's something that you did really well and, and your oversight in the process and just reminding them. I mean, you don't necessarily need any of those fancy certifications. You can get them if you want. But at the end of the day, you know what you're putting into the process and you know how you could either cut a corner or you could be more thoughtful. Um, and I felt like you did a great job at, at overseeing that. Stop. <laughs> um, so, in what ways did we, um, you know, approach this from a, sustain a sustainable standpoint? What were some of your, your key key favorites? Um, well, certainly, um, you know, non toxic materials and, and finishes, so non toxic paint and. Um, well, 90% of the furniture was all sourced uh, locally, secondhand, and yeah. vintage. Um, all, we did have some custom upholstery pieces, and we made sure that everything was not toxic fillings, and they were upholstered in renewable materials like hemp and canvas. Yeah, and then even down to the mattresses, you know, Naturepedic makes, makes great pro uh, products that don't off gas. I mean, you think about you're inhaling that all night long, like what could that do to you? And so. And they're filling. Do they use soy? They use soy latex. They use wool blends. So they they have different combinations that they use depending on what you want for comfort. But and then all the vintage pieces. Um, but I think also sourcing locally. I think um, that was kind of my favorite part of it. Um, also, it's an, in a way giving back to your your community in a very direct way. So. Um, What's cool about it also is you, you aren't like, your house doesn't look like everybody else's. It's not like a cookie cutter version of anything. And you can really have an authentic point of view and perspective. 
Um, yeah, sourcing locally was huge for this project because the timeline was really tight. Um, oh, we didn't tell everyone what you wanted to do with the house when it was all done. Well, what do you mean? Well, like, what was the purpose of running? You weren't going to move back into it. No, but I, but I mean, maybe like later on down the road, I could see myself like just having a place for like my kids when they grow up or something. Like, I, you know, I could imagine us right. having it for that. But I wanted to rent it out like a luxury kind of rental. Also, because I want this house. Like when I go to I go to New York a lot and stay in hotels, but I would love an a, like an apartment or a house like this that I could stay in that's cozy and um, and just has this like nice, luxurious, clean, modern feel, but not too sterile. So we drew inspiration from some of your favorite boutique hotels, like the Gramercy Park Hotel or the Bowery Hotel, and kind of gave it this old world old world flair with a little bit of edge. Um, so it was super fun because it was eclectic from the beginning, from the concept, and it was super easy to work with Cherish and Woven Accents on finding just the right pieces. Um, so Anna, talking about Cherish and talking about how we source things on that website, um, in what ways, and this might be kind of an obvious question to everyone, but in what ways is Cherish a sustainable business? Well, I mean, oh, I mean oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're a marketplace for vintage and pre-owned stuff, so, and furniture and decor. So by nature, we're all about upcycling and re repurposing with as, you know, a very specific um, style focus in that everything's curated. Um, so you really only see beautiful pieces. Um, and the other thing is we allow people and enable on the site for you to search and find things locally. And that's what we did on your project is we looked, you know, within a 10, 20, 30 mile radius around the house and found, I think, the lion's share of the product right there in your neighborhood, um, which is awesome both from a green standpoint, but also from a time standpoint, because we did this whole thing in like two weeks. Yeah, so it when was you think about, Yeah, so when you think about you know, waiting 16 or 18 weeks for a sofa from a big box retailer versus getting something with a lot of unique character and that's really cool, then it's available locally at a great price in a matter of days, that's pretty compelling, and I think that's why um, our business has been so strong. Um, and then Jenna, Woven Accents has a lot of fun, um, kind of sustainable efforts right now um, when we're talking about upcycling and renewing materials. Um, tell us about the kinds of things you have going on here. Well, we have a couple of projects going on that I'm really excited about. One is a collaboration with an LA-based artist. His name is Cole Sternberg. And he's going to be working with some of our antique pieces and actually screen printing on them. But it doesn't stop there. We actually will have an event on each one of the rugs. We're gonna do about 10. So one will live on the beach in Santa Monica for the day. One will have a picnic on in like Griffith Park. Another one's gonna sit at the bottom of a pool. You know, another will be downtown and just have people walking over it. And we'll photograph all of these things and at the end have a show and sort of document, okay, this rug was originally circa 1880s. Now 2015, Santa Monica Pier, or wherever, you know, wherever it was documented that way. So that's one way, I think, to make these um, old pieces more modern and sort of upcycled and make them even more unique. Um, and another project we are working on for 2016, we're calling Recreated, and we're um, actually working with um, old samples and remnants as the base material I'm working with weavers in the Sahara, and they will re-weave re those materials into a new rug design. So those are a couple of the things we're doing. That's really cool. Just taking something old, making it new again, yeah. giving it another story. Um, very neat. Um, so Anna, talking about innovation in the industry, um, you know, you were on the beat of the trends in vintage, thanks to all the useful analytics that you have. Yep. Um, what can you tell us about some of the trends in vintage right now? Well, mid-century continues to be really strong for us, um, but the other um, big trends we see are brutalism, and then also in, um, Memphis, Memphis style we see coming back, which is really fun. Pomo. Uh, what did you say? Pomo. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, it's funny, I was just reading that Karl Lagerfeld is the largest collection collector of Memphis in the world. Um, so obviously a trendsetter, so maybe that's where it's coming from, but we're seeing, um, we're seeing a lot of interest in that. Mm -hmm. So are you able to see 
like what the most sought after category of vintage furniture? Yeah. So what 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 are people most searching for? Um, well, search is interesting because you have to have you know it's it's somebody who's kind of what we call a hunter versus a gatherer, right? It's somebody who's looking for something specifically. Um, so our most searched for item is actually dining chairs, and um, it's we have a ton of them on the site. And dining chairs are really expensive, um, and you have to buy a lot of them, and you kind of need them when you need them, and so it's a great category for us. Um, what is the most purchased item on Cherish? We do great with decor. Um, so rugs, art, um, small tabletop items, pillows, um, mirrors are really strong performers for us, as well as lighting. So small, small stuff. Small stuff moves. Small stuff, small stuff moves easily, yeah. Um, what's the hardest thing? for someone to hawk um, on Cherish. <laughs> you know, honestly, I feel bad saying this because you sold Jessica some custom pieces, but custom furniture is hard, um, especially when it has really odd dimensions. And we get a lot of people who are like, my designer, you know, and I worked on this piece and it costs this much money. And you're like, yeah, but it's for a very specific corner that's only in your house. <laughs> it's really hard to imagine how that can get repurposed easily in someone else's space. So those pieces tend to be tough. I mean, we take them, but it, it takes longer. But when you stumble upon one that's incredible, yeah. it's like the most special thing ever. You're like, yeah. no one else in the world has this like random little two-seater settee with stripes and weird legs, and now I get to buy it. That's right. <laughs> Um, what other analytics are important for you to pay attention to as you guys continue to grow? I mean, for us right now, lucky thing is is really how fast we can get the stuff onto the site. So we have listings coming in from all over the country all the time, and you know, it's just pushing it through and getting it live quick enough um, is our biggest challenge right now. Um, so time on, time to from listing to on site is probably the analytics that we look at most closely right now. Um, and then, of course, we're always looking at sell-through. And one of the really cool things about this business is to see the different um, taste differences by region. So, um, for example, we'll get a lot of listings in the Midwest, but they'll sell to people out on the East Coast um, or the West Coast. And then we see the more traditional furniture going the opposite direction. So there's almost like this taste arbitrage that goes back and forth with the different um, styles across the country. And it's really interesting to see the uniqueness of each market and that's, city. That's all really fascinating data yes. that you hold on to there. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Jess, why vintage? What's so cool about it? Um, I think, I think I said. <laughs> I, don't, I love the stories. I love that something had a life and a history and, um, I don't know, the character. And I like things that are a little bit worn in and beaten up a little bit. And it doesn't feel so sterile. Um, and it, it has, yeah, I just like that it has a, a, a life and a character to it. What tips would you give anyone trying to incorporate vintage into their current situation? I think starting with accent pieces is like the least scary thing to do, right? Um, so, you know, buy the big things that you're comfortable with buying that you just, you know, know that you can't part with. Um, but, you know, definitely invest in lamps and um, frames and mirrors and rugs and just different uh, pillows, you know, just different little pieces that you can put around that big giant thing that's in everybody else's house to make it look a little bit different. <laughs> Jenna, what advice would you offer someone shopping for a 200-year-old rug? How, how, how to incorporate that into their house in the best way? Wow. Um, well, shop here. <laughs> um, and for me, I, I mean, personally, I love the mixing. And there are a lot of designers that work with us that you know, they buy a lot of these, you know, distressed antiques like the, the high me, and they put them in these modern settings. And to me, it's the mixing of both. And I think Cameron Spear did an amazing job in the front window doing yes, exactly it's here that. Yes, window. Um, I mean, we have this perfect, I think, balance of old and new and reworked and repurposed, and they've used rugs in one of the most interesting ways we've seen in the window thus far as architectural elements and textural and um, that backsplash is a rug 
not not tile. Um, so I just, for me, I think it's the mixing is really the most important. Anna, master of vintage. Anna, sorry. <laughs> I think it's uh, I think it's all about just not being afraid. You know, I mean that's the great thing about vintage is you know give it a shot. And I like the idea of using it and starting initially with the smaller pieces and using them as accessories and to really customize and personalize your space. And the nice thing is if you decide you know you've outgrown it or you're moving, you know relist it, sell it again. We have tons of people who buy from us, use something, and then list it again and sell it, start over again. So there's sort of that, um, don't think of it as permanent. I mean, that's the beauty, I think, of, of Cherish and the, and the ability to, to buy and sell so easily. You can change out your space quickly. And now that we've kind of like passed the 90s fad of eco-friendly, um, you know, we don't really hear much about it anymore. You know, and I don't know if it's a quiet issue because it's fallen out of fashion or just because it's become adapted by so many people and companies that it's just more commonplace. Um, but now having gone through this idea of you know, talking about vintage and upcycling and following your own rules for being sustainable, yeah. what does sustainability mean to you personally? I think for me it's that before you buy anything, check and see if there's a way to repurpose something first. I mean, it just when you think about the advantages to buying vintage of being you can get it right away, um, you'll get a great deal on it, um, it's going to be unique and cooler by nature. And it has the benefits of um, upcycling and the green benefits of that. Like, why wouldn't you look at that as your first choice and option always? That's what it means for me. Jenna, what about you? What does sustainability mean to you? Well, I think rules were made to be broken, so I don't look at it as being like a strict list of things. Um, I'm a foodie, and I think of it as being how, in the same way I look at it, having a healthy like diet. You know, I don't limit myself from having my favorite things. I think it's all about balance and creating habits that then become a lifestyle, you know, one step at a time. So for me, it's breaking, you know, little steps, little goals down into habits, and then eventually you have a lifestyle. Jess, what about you? Um, I agree with both of these ladies. Um, and I, I also think it's just about having a consciousness about your consumption and being thoughtful about it, knowing that whatever you're bringing into your home or into your life or whatever you're purchasing, it, had, it was made from something. Someone had to make it. There was energy that was put into it. And just being thoughtful about that process. Um, and so that's all. Thank you. <laughs> Such nice insight from three lady bosses. <laughs> Um, I think we have a few minutes, so I would love to open it up to everyone that came out today to see if um, anyone had any questions for any of our wonderful panelists um, in terms of starting up in the design industry, sustainability. It could be whatever you want. If you're a designer, for example, we get called in to look at a client's home, you know, they have it, they, we want to help them sell it because we want to be able to have a clean palette. Do you help with the photography? Is there, what's the relationship like? Yeah, most of our um, items that are listed by individuals, they just use our app. We were just voted the number one app by Architectural Digest, which was really nice. Thank you, Art Digest. Mm -hmm. um, it really takes about two minutes to list something. We take over your camera on the phone for a second, you take the pictures, write the description, submit it, and we take it from there. If you do want somebody to come to the house and do that, we can also um, do that for you as well. And some clients like that, but just full for full service, um, we can offer that too. Yeah. Shipping as well, right? And yeah, and so then the, when the item's posted on the site, when it sells, um, if it's local pickup, um, at that point we provide the address and you guys arrange the, um, the timing. Um, but if it's something that needs to be picked up, then we manage that process as well, and that's all paid for by the buyer, not the seller. So um, it's pretty turnkey as a seller. Well, thank you so much for coming out. Please give another round of applause for Jessica, Anna, and Jenna. Thank you so much for joining us for LCDQ. We really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, we'll be hanging out. Feel free to come up and say hello, and otherwise, enjoy LCDQ. Thank you.